Um, so yeah, I was not expecting to be here, but I'm happy to speak to all of you now. Um, today's topic is flying blind accessibility and monitoring. So it's not just about monitoring, it's not just about accessibility, it's more or less on, I want to show you what other people see when they look at the web or at specific tools. So yeah, the internet has a lot of barriers with people, uh, for people with impairments. And I want to give you an overview on how to improve your website, if you're building websites or your tools, and what to pay attention to when using the internet as well. So those people can be included in all of our activities and make more valuable contributions to our discussions. So just for introductions, this is me in various different formats. Um, my name's Foy Murek, um, my pronouns are they, them, and I work as a development advocate for Isinga. Isinga is a monitoring tool, some of you might have heard of it already. It's a fork of Nagios, and yeah, I started out as a developer there where I worked a lot in web development and did a lot of accessibility work, and now I'm more or less the development community interface where I do stuff like this and do talks and just trying to integrate people into the way we work. So, let's jump right into accessibility. So, the definition of accessibility according to the Cambridge Business English Dictionary is the quality or characteristic of something that makes it possible to approach, enter or use it. So basically, be the in-between between the users and the thing they want to get into contact with. The main focus is going to be visual impairment for now. So this includes color vision deficiencies and also the complete inability to interact with visual elements. Um, just to get it started, let's have a look at the numbers. So globally, 285 million people are affected by some kind of visual impairment. That would be one out of 11 people, just to visualize, that would be this one figure out of all of them. And this number would also be just a tiny smidge less than the entire population of the United States. That is a lot of people that need aid to interact with tools that we use every day without even thinking about it. And 98% of US-based web pages are not accessible um, from a legal perspective. So there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of attention to be paid. To get into it, um, where does color vision deficiency even come from? So our eyes have different cones for color vision. There's the red one, the green one, and the blue one. And those three cones allow us humans to see the spectrum that we can see by mixing those different colors together to get the color that we're looking at. But like all things now, buddies, those things can malfunction. And in most cases, they won't be completely unable to distinguish between certain colors. It's just a little harder. But we want to be inclusive to everyone here. And that way, we're going to look at actual color blindness from here on out, where one of the cones or multiple don't work at all. <clears throat> so you can maybe see the difference between those three stages. So we have full color vision, partial, and full color blindness. So the most common variants are those three that I've shown you here. So we have deuteranopia and protonopia, which are commonly referred to as red-green blindness on the left side, so where either the red or the green cone doesn't work. And there's also a rarer form, tritonopia, which is sometimes called yellow-blue blindness. So red-green blindness is present in roughly 7% of people to some extent. Um, the yellow-blue blindness is just a bit over 1% of the population. It's typically a little higher in male people. So uh, since we're in a tech environment, and as you all know, there are a lot of people that might be affected by this. So in a singer, a monitoring tool, as you can imagine, the primary colors used are red, orange, 
and green, or red, yellow, and green, which are a little difficult to distinguish if you have any form of red-green blindness. So um, the squares in the top row here are the unaltered colors, the default colors, as you will. And below you can see how those colors look like to people that are affected by one of the forms of the color blindness. As you can tell, it's kind of different to, like, difficult to differentiate between red and green, which are kind of like the important ones to differentiate. So here in the tactical overview, we see the colors in a bit more context. So on the far left, there are the normal colors as you would see them, and on the right, you can see how they're affected. So in the middle one, you see between the red-green blindness and the normal color vision. If you focus on the red and the green, you can't really tell it apart, and the only way to see how they're different is from the context, that there's something in the middle in between them. It gets even more difficult with a grid view, for example. So if you have normal color vision, I have killed the microphone, sorry. Um, so you can see uh, in the grid, the most noticeable ones are the ones that you need to see. So green is the normal color, everything is cool. It's not important to see those green ones, but it is important to see the red ones because those are the ones you will be reacting to. And keep in mind, that accessible design is super important. A lot of people are affected. And a lot of people are affected that you don't even know about or that they don't even know that they have some sort of efficiency because it's always been there for their entire lives. And it's crucial that we don't withhold that information. So one way to think around it or work around it is theming. So you can see in the top, we have our default colors, and below that is our colorblind theme. So what we did there is make the more important colors darker. So the green is not something you will be focusing on. You won't be clicking on OK states all the time. What you want to be focusing on is what's critical. So we lightened up and blended the color of the OK state more into the background. So the states that are more important pop out more just by, um, yeah, brightness. So the darker something is, the more severe is it, it is and the more attention you will be paying to it. So here is a picture without. And this is what the states look like with the differentiation applied, with the colorblind theme applied. <clears throat> In the grid as well, now you can actually see what is important and what isn't, even for people that have some sort of vision deficiency. It's something to take in, like, into consideration when you design colors and apply colors to your tooling. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing, maybe, if the brightness is so different, but what you want to be focusing is on is that it works for the vastest amount of people possible. But what is if someone can't see at all? How do blind people navigate that? Because all of the fun that we can have with colors, it won't affect the people that cannot see. So, for this, I have prepared a video. Let's see if this works. Hi, my name is Jason Holt. I'm with the Universal Access Department. Today, we will be demonstrating a screen reader. Uh, with a screen reader, uh, I, as a blind person, can navigate to a web page. And I don't use a mouse because I can't see where the mouse is pointing, but I can use a keyboard and JAWS, the screen reader, will tell me where I am on the page and allow me to read various parts of the page. Okay, let's take a few minutes to actually see how JAWS works. Here we are at my main screen on my computer and I, I want to browse the internet, so I will open up a browser. I'll press the Windows key. Menu, search box edit, type text, and edit field, or press up or down there. 
and Jaws announced that I have a menu. Then I want to find my browser. My favorite browser is Firefox. Jaws 17.0, one of Internet Explorer Subnet Word 2013 Subnet, Firefox Submenu 406. Oh, Firefox, that's the one I want, so I'll press Enter. Enter, leaving menus, Firefox, Mozilla Firefox, start page, dash Mozilla Firefox, search clear. That opens the browser. Now I'll press Alt-D to put my cursor in the navigation bar. Alt-D, navigation, toolbar, toolbar, search. Now let's go to our homepage, the Community College's homepage. So I'll type SLCC. Period. E D U. E D U. You notice that JAWS repeats to me each character as I type it. That way, if I make a mistake, I can hear it and I can backspace. Slash. U H T T P forward slash. And I can retype it again. U. Search your address at combo. S L C C. Now press enter. S L C C dash Mozilla Firefox page has three regions, eight headings, and sixty-eight links. S L C C. Oh, it says S L C C. It sounds like I'm on the right page. Okay, here we are on our home page, and. I want to go to the accessibility page, the college's accessibility page. I don't know where that is on this uh, screen, so I'll do a search. I'm searching for accessibility. Oh, it tells me I'm now on the link that says accessibility. That's what I want, so I'll press enter on that link. Enter, accessibility visited link. Vertical bar is LCC dash Mozilla Firefox. Vertical bar is LCC list. Page has three regions, one heading and 69 links. List of two items, link SLCC slash accessibility. Okay, I'm on the accessibility page. If I press H, which lets me jump from header to header. Accessibility heading level one. Heading, I'm sorry, not header. Ah, oh, I'm at the head accessibility heading. Let's read what it says under that. List of seven items. Oh, there's a list of items. Visited link home. Home. Web accessibility. Accessibility. Link web accessibility. Web accessibility. Link purchasing. Purchasing. Link web accessibility. Link accessible documents. Accessible documents. Link types of disabilities. Types of disability. Visited link captioning. Captioning. List end. Now let's hear what the di the uh, text says underneath the heading. Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. More specifically, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and that they can contribute to the web. One thing you should know is that having a screen reader by itself does not make the internet accessible to me. If you look at our homepage, and as I navigate through it, SLCC. you'll find that there are headings Summer classes heading level two. and regions which the designers have made some effort to put into the page that allow me to jump from section to section so I don't have to SLCC. stop and explore every little link to find where I want to be. On some web pages where there might be almost a hundred links but yet there's no way to skip to the main part of this article that I want to read so I have to skip from link to link to link and jump from section to section to find where I want to be the main article. Sometimes it is frustrating but after one has some experience with a screen reader uh, you learn some tricks. Um, a lot of people won't have had the experience of using a screen reader yet. I've tried it out before. I've tried it out on different websites and it has been really difficult to get used to it. Um, and what is super important, what uh, the speaker just now already mentioned, is having structure in your tools, in your websites, for the screen reader to actually be useful. Because you don't want to be skipping through a hundred links. So your content needs to be weighted. And weighted means that a document is split into different sections and doesn't have to be read through from the top to the bottom, but can be skipped through to the important parts that you might want to see. So you want to focus on the important parts again. So when designing any kind of tool, try to envision what's important for the users to see right away, to jump to, before you implement what it looks like. So... <clears throat> If it isn't weighted, there is no way of telling what's important. And sighted people can differentiate just by styling, but unsighted people need that structure of having a header, of having different navigation elements to be able to jump to the main content and maybe see a sign-up form and not having to skip through it all. Um, what that looks like, I'm not sure if you can actually read it properly, um, but on the left, the one with a greenish background, we have 
um, a structure where you can already see from just looking at the HTML that it is ordered, that there are lists, that there are headings that are declared that way. And on the right side, you can see it's just written down. The content is just blurred to the page. And if you structure your HTML, this means no BR tags, no breaks, and try to declare what your content is within the declaration of the tags. And use the CSS to the styling. Don't, don't do it in the HTML. Um, so static content or generally content loaded from other web pages like iframes or certain widgets that you don't control directly are a bit difficult or um, yeah, have to be treated with special attention because you can't um, control what they, what they display and you might want to add a description what is in there, what they're supposed to show. If you have a JPEG somewhere a blind person will not be able to tell what's in the JPEG. And then you need to use alternate descriptions to give the content and give the context that other people might be missing out on. Um, it's already in use on Twitter, for example, so if you're tweeting, maybe pay attention to that little plus alt key button that's on there and add a description for people that won't be able to see your images. Um, yeah, and the next topic is state changes. So if you have a widget like a checkbox or radio buttons, for example, you want to be declaring the current state of that widget as well. And ARIA, um, accessible, accessibility rich internet applications, I think it's uh, short for, uh, helps you with that. So that is basically, um, the, the framework you can use to make your applications accessible. So indicate whether something is checked or disabled or grabbed. And make sure to use those things in the HTML so we can also apply them with styling. So if something is checked, you can also use that ARIA checked attribute to style your CSS around. And the same goes to visibility changes. For sighted people, you can just hide something away, but it will still be in the document tree. It will still be read by the screen reader if you're using it. So um, that's what the ARIA hidden property value is for. So the screen reader will read through it, recognize it, and then not display or not read out what there is because it's supposed to be hidden, right? <laughs> So generally, um, try to read up on ARIA if you do anything in the web, if you try to implement any kind of HTML-based tooling, and use the different sets and attributes that they provide for you to make it better for people and make your applications more accessible. So basically, if you want to build any kind of application, design with accessibility in mind. Usually it's an afterthought. It's something that you think of when a company comes to you like, hey, we would like to buy your product, but we need to have it accessible for our users. And then it's a lot of work to implement. But if you start out designing a product, make sure that you think of accessibility before you come to the point where it's a lot of effort to do. So. I think I'm at the 20-minute mark now, and I want to thank you for your attention, and thank you for listening to me bramble about accessibility for a while. And, yeah, have a nice rest of the day. Woo!